Have you ever gone to a art museum? Ever visited an art museum? I've, I've been to a few. I like to think of myself as a type of person who frequents art museums. And so when I go, I do what I see other people doing. You know, I'll, I'll walk up to a painting and I'll put my arms behind my back and I'll, I'll lean in and carefully look at the painting. I'll observe the frame, the scenery, the colors. Take it all in. Then, because I've seen people do it, I'll move close and lean in and look around and make sure people see me looking close like I know what I'm supposed to do. Observing the brush strokes and the minute details, thinking about what the artist must have thought as he was in his studio and as she was painting. That's the way you're supposed to do it, I think. You're supposed to look at the art intently, trying to take it all in, and sometimes you have to get close to see the details. But there's one type of artwork that that method is totally unsuited for. It's called pixel art. Now, I want to give you a few examples this morning. Here, I want you to look at this picture and tell me what you see. We're zoomed in real close. You, you got it? Tetris? No, it's not Tetris. Scott, show us what it is. Who is it now? Abraham Lincoln. You got you to gotta step back. Getting close isn't too helpful. Here's another one. What do you think of this? Get, got anything to go on? No, that's a little harder. You get up close and you zoom in. It's kind of hard to tell what you're looking at, but if you zoom out, it's the Eiffel Tower. Pixel art. I got another one for you. This is perhaps the most beautiful painting that's ever been made. Can you tell what it is? It's got to show us. Roll Tide. <laughs> Pixel art. Pixel art. In, in art, you think you get up close, you're an art historian, you get your magnifying glass and you zoom in real close. You want to understand all the minute details, but sometimes getting close is useless. And that's the way it is with Jesus. Most of the time you think the closer you get, the better off you are, but as we see in these stories we just read, when it comes to Jesus, proximity doesn't always guarantee perception. Your closeness to him doesn't guarantee you'll comprehend what he's doing. In fact, I think sometimes it's the people who are closest to Jesus who are at biggest risk of developing attitudes that prevent them from seeing who he really is, from understanding his significance, from comprehending his mission. And so this morning, I want to work through this passage, and I want to expose two of those attitudes Two attitudes that keep you from seeing Jesus for who he really is. And I want to show you the cure to it. How do you get beyond it? This is today's sermon in a sentence. The only cure for spiritual blindness is the supernatural work of Jesus. So that's what we're going to see. We'll get there after we expose the two attitudes. Now we're winding up this series, The Unexpected Kingdom, and after this week, there's only one more sermon. We'll close out chapter 8 next week. And as we do, we'll transition from the first act of Mark's gospel into the second act. And when we come back to it after Labor Day, we'll pick up in chapter 9, and things will have changed. The first act of Mark is primarily concerned with Jesus' growing popularity. He shows up in Mark chapter 1, proclaiming the times fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. And everywhere he goes, he performs mighty miracles and teaches with authority, and everybody spreads the word about him. So he can't go anywhere without people showing up, looking to get in on the blessings of the kingdom. But at the same time, his popularity is growing. There's also a deepening conflict with the religious leaders. And so we've seen the the conflict with the scribes and Pharisees, and we've seen his conflict with Herod, and on and on and on, even in our passage today, he's warning his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Deepening conflict. And among all that, there's the persistent confusion of the hand-selected men who were brought into Jesus' inner circle. All three of the stories that we're looking at today capture those themes, his popularity, his opposition 
in the confusion of his disciples. And they all work together to make us ask the question, do we see who Jesus is? Do we see who Jesus is? The reality of Jesus both then and now is most people don't see Jesus for who he is. They'll say he's a good teacher or a great moral example, but they are spiritually blind to his true significance. There's a theological reason for that. Paul says in Romans 1 that we were created by God to know him, but we exchange the truth of God for a lie. And because of that, God has turned us over to a darkened mind. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. We're blinded, both by our sinful nature and by an enemy that wants to keep us in the dark to the reality of God. The spiritual blindness that we're talking about this morning is a lack of perception about who Jesus really is. You fail to see him for who he really is. And the two attitudes that Mark brings to our attention today are deadly, if you want to know the truth about Christ. The first we see in the Pharisees is an attitude of skepticism. Skepticism. Uh, it's obvious in the Pharisees' request. Look at it with me again in verse 11. It said, The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Matthew says in Matthew 16, they came out saying, Teacher, we want to see from you a sign. Now, to understand that, the sign, you got to know the Old Testament background. The Old Testament teaches God's people to approach professing teachers, prophets, with an attitude of skepticism. To not just accept what they're saying as God's truth, but to test them, to see if their prophecies come true. And if they don't come true, they are supposed to throw rocks at them until they die. And if they do come true, they're supposed to listen to them. So there's this attitude of, well, hey, here's a, a preacher, a prophet, proclaiming some things about God. Let's put him to the test. Let's see if he's trustworthy or not. And so on face value, what we see in the Pharisees seems to be what we see written down in the rabbi's records where they say that every person should test the teacher. But I think there's more to it than that. I think there's a deeper problem. The Pharisees are not the objective seekers of truth that we like to think of ourselves as. They're not on a truth quest trying to discover the true nature of Jesus. They've already determined who he is. They said back in Mark chapter 3, 22, that he casts out demons by the prince of demons. And he's possessed by Beelzebul. They've seen everything Jesus has done, and they have assumed, have concluded that he's performing his miracles by the power of Satan. So I don't think they're on a truth quest trying to get down to the bottom of this. And if it turns out that Jesus is God's son, well, then they'll obey. Now, I think they've already come to a foregone conclusion. And I kind of envision this scenario kind of like the scene of Elijah and the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. Y'all remember that story? Here's Elijah, the prophet of God, uh, matched up against the prophet. I see some of y'all looking at each other and laughing. It's like y'all must have been talking about this lately. And uh, so uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal set up this test where the prophets of Baal are going to call on their god, Baal, to send down fire from heaven and consume the offering on the altar. And uh, so they go through this elaborate ritual of their chanting and their prayers. They start to mutilate themselves and go on and on. And all the, t all the while, Elijah's over there saying, hey, where's your god? If he fall asleep, maybe he's in the bathroom. Give him a minute. He'll be back soon. You know? And finally, Elijah steps up to the plate and calls on God, and fire comes down, and it consumes the offering, and it consumes the altar. All that's left is a crater. You know? And I think that's what the Pharisees were hoping for. I think they wanted to set Jesus up to a test, and they wanted to publicly discredit him, make a fool of him. Show us a sign that God's really with you, thinking to themselves, we know he's not. And so if he'll go through the motions of calling down for a sign from heaven, everybody will see that Jesus isn't who he claims to be. This isn't the objective quest for truth. It's the defiant challenge of a skeptic. Show me the proof 
We know this, the Greek word for test is actually only used four times in Mark's gospel. Three times it refers to the Pharisees, the scribes, their attempt to test Jesus. The only other time it refers to Satan when in the wilderness he tested Jesus for 40 days. So this isn't an objective search for truth. This is the defiant challenge of a skeptic. And I think if you were to search for an attitude that defines the spirit of our age, you'd have to land right here. We live in a skeptical world. The skeptic approaches questions of truth with an attitude of suspicion. The burden of proof is placed on the one who claims to have truth. And so the Pharisees put the burden of proof on Jesus. Hey, if you really are who you say you are, prove it. They're looking for undeniable, unmistakable facts that render faith a moot point. You don't need faith if it's verifiable. And so they approach the Bible and spiritual things with an attitude of skepticism and suspicion, thinking that they're employing the scientific method and are going to get down to the bottom of things. And once they do, then they'll know. They'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's true. But I think the skeptic makes a terrible miscalculation, and perhaps they're more deaf than they are blind. Because when they hear the invitation of the gospel... They hear it as see and believe. When really, Jesus said, repent and believe. It's as a matter of faith. And the skeptical attitude has no place for it. But of course, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so they start out on this quest to discover truth. And from the beginning, they've guaranteed their failure. They'll never discover who he really is because they've already decided in their heart that he can't be who he claims to be. And so the Pharisees' skepticism leaves them in the dark, totally blind to Jesus' true significance. I wonder, I put the question to you. When you come to Scripture and the Bible and truth about Jesus, where, where does your heart lie? Where, what's your attitude? What's your posture? Are you the type of person who says, i got to see it to believe it? Show me the proof. Do you have this unshakable desire in your heart to get down to the bottom of everything before you can settle it? That's not the way it works. Catholic bishop of Canterbury in the 11th century was a man named Anselm. And his personal motto on his seal that's come down to us over the last thousand years. It's probably familiar to you. It is faith seeking understanding. Faith seeking understanding. The skeptic reverses it. Understanding seeking faith. But the people of God start with faith and then allow him to fill in the blanks. You don't have to know everything there is to know about Jesus to get started on the journey. He says, repent, believe, follow me. And things become clearer over time. So I wonder, are you a skeptic? Maybe you're not a skeptic, but maybe you are guilty of this second attitude we see in verse 14. Attitude I'm calling apathy which comes through the disciples on the boat. Mark says they'd forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And Jesus was giving orders to them, saying, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. This is, this is comedic. This is a funny scene. Apparently, Jesus last week was in Gentile territory on the northeast side of the lake. He apparently went to the northwest side of the lake where the Pharisees showed up, and now he's back in the boat with his disciples, heading back to Bethsaida on the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee, and he's thinking about what's just happened with the Pharisees. And he says, the the Greek word is, see, look out, beware, see, 
the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven is, of course, the agent which causes bread dough to rise and get all fluffy and to create all those wonderful little air bubbles inside of it that makes the croissant the perfect receptacle for honey and butter, right? Uh, I, I first discovered yeast during the beginning of the COVID pandemic when there was no bread in the shelves. And so we all decided, hey, like my grandmother used to make bread, so I can do it too. And of course, that was a massive failure. And there's such a thing as over kneading the dough. But the leaven Jesus is talking about is not Fleischmann's yeast. Is that the name of it? And the little packet or the jar? And that stuff's cultured. They create that in the lab to make sure that it reacts the same way when you mix in all your ingredients. So it's a predictable chemical reaction. The fermentation process gets started, the dough rises, and in a couple of hours, you stick your loaf in the oven. They didn't have that in the ancient world. Instead, they used a, a more organic technique. They would save back a, lit, a little bit of today's dough so that tomorrow they would have a starter to begin the leavening process in the next day's bread. And this is usually foolproof. It creates wonderful sourdough loaves. But it can go sour. And the bacteria that usually creates those air bubbles can turn toxic and can kill. And what Jesus saw in his disciples' heart was the same attitude present in the Pharisees taking root. That the unbelieving, skeptical attitude, the leavening agent which produced in the Pharisees an attitude of skepticism and unbelief was present already in his disciples. And if they weren't careful, it was going to expand and it was going to infect the whole of their faith. And so he told them to watch out beware. And of course, they were like us and immediately understood the spiritual significance of the thing Jesus said, right? Now they said, what's he talking about? We've only got one loaf of bread. They, they missed the spiritual significance for their immediate situation. They're consumed with the fact that they only have one loaf of bread. His command to beware jogs their memory. And they realize in what terrible predicament they are. And so Jesus gets exasperated, just about loses his patience with them. What are you guys talking about? You don't have any bread. Don't you remember when there were 5,000 hungry people on the beach? How I took the five loaves and multiplied it, and you guys picked up 12 baskets full? There was a basket for each of you that day. Why are you worried about one loaf of bread? And don't you remember how I was with the 4,000 and I multiplied the seven loaves? How many baskets, large baskets of broken pieces did you pick up? Seven. Then why are you concerned that you only have one loaf? His unstated question is this. Don't you guys realize that if the bread is the problem, I'm the answer. But there's a deeper issue here than bread and you are completely blind to it. The disciples had a front row seat to every miracle Jesus performed. Every bit of proof that the Pharisees wanted, the disciples had. They'd heard him teach over and over and over. They'd seen it with their own eyes. They had handed out the multiplied loaves. There was no denying that Jesus was capable, but they were so dull that they missed the connection. I call it apathetic because after repeated exposure to the spiritual reality at work in Jesus, it had lost all effect in their hearts. Jesus is Jesus for them, but Jesus isn't Jesus for us. Multiplying bread is the kind of thing he does for 5,000 people. We're here in the boat and we don't have enough for us. Never connecting it to their present situation. They were dull, desensitized, disconnected. And worst of all, they weren't just blind to the truth about Jesus. They were blind to the fact they were blind. I mean, Jesus quotes to them Isaiah 6. Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? Now, if you've been with us in Mark's Gospel, this should ring a bell. 
Jesus has already quoted this one time in the gospel back in Mark chapter 4 when he was explaining to his disciples the purpose of his parables. He said in Mark 4, 11, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables, so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. On that day, Jesus was trying to help his disciples understand the difference between an insider and an outsider. The insiders, the twelve, had an inside route to the truth of the kingdom. Jesus was going to speak in parables, and he was going to open them up and unpack them for his disciples so they knew what he was getting at. But people outside were going to get it in parables so that they would be provoked to search deeper into the truth. And finding just a little seed, they would keep after it until it bloomed into a full-grown plant. But because of the disciples' apathy, what he calls the hardness of their hearts, that line between insider and outsider had been almost completely blurred. They were as in just a bad position as people who are on the outside of the kingdom looking in. Because of that, I think it's always a greater risk for people who call themselves followers of Christ. There's always a greater risk for us, for me and you. People out there, they're living their life for themselves, and they're pretty much fine with that. Maybe inside they feel a little bit of guilt, like, hey, I should be a better person. I should be kinder to my coworkers. I should treat my kids a little bit better, treat my wife different. But for the most part, they're content with their lives as it is. In here, we get God's word repeatedly spoken over us, preached to us or at us. All the while, we comfort ourselves and saying, hey, you know, it's a good thing we know God's truth. And how often are we like the disciples? We know it. We can recite it. We can even explain it. But there's a huge disconnect between here and here, between our heads and our hearts. We know Jesus is the Savior of the world, that sinners should repent. And we're thankful when our preachers remind people of that. But sometimes we fail to apply that to our own hearts, just as the disciples who'd seen Jesus multiply bread for almost 10,000 people by this point, thought that he was going to be outmatched by the predicament there in the boat. The attitude of apathy I'm talking about is the one that says spiritual truth is great, but fails to apply it to your own life. You get into that rut, you're going to stay in the dark spiritually. You're going to stay spiritually blind to the true significance of Jesus. So I wonder if that's you. Have you lost sight of the significance of Jesus for you? Not just that Jesus saved some people from their sins, but that he saved you from your sins. Not that he calls some people to follow him on the hard path of discipleship, but that he's called you. Not that he has a purpose and plan for some people and that he's given the church the mission to make disciples of all nations, but that he has a purpose and plan for you and he's called you to join him in his mission to seek and save the lost. Have you lost sight of Jesus' significance? Have you grown apathetic? The application of his truth to your own soul. And so listen, the only cure the spiritual blindness that you're experiencing is a supernatural work of Jesus. That's what I think we see in this last story. They came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. This story is interesting because the only gospel writer who includes it in his gospel is Mark. This is the only time you find this story in the entire New Testament. It's the only time in the Gospels when Jesus' first attempt at a miracle fails. And he has to go back and try again. Most commentators think that's why Mark and Luke, who tend to have all the material Mark had, or while Matthew and Luke 
tend to have all the material Mark has in his gospel. Matthew and Luke don't have this story, probably because when they were writing down the gospels, they kind of felt uncomfortable that their Savior and Lord tried to heal a man's vision and had to try again. So they just sort of left that one out. I don't know. Um, But I think Mark is trying to make a point. I think Mark puts this story where he does to try to draw our attention to our desperate need for Jesus to do for us what he did for this man. The story is a lot like the deaf man who had difficulty speaking. Of course, Jesus came into the region of the Decapolis earlier in chapter 7, and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had difficulty speaking. And so Jesus grabbed the man, took him away from the crowd, spit on his tongue, and said, be opened up. Plugged his ears and said, be opened up. And the man was healed. Here Jesus takes this blind man aside, away from the crowd. He spits in his eyes. I think he spits in his hands and rubs in his eyes. And heals him and says, hey, can you see anything? And you heard what he said. He said, I can see something, but I see men. They look like trees walking around. And so Jesus touched his eyes again, and then he could see clearly. I think Mark wants us to recognize that the Pharisees wanted to see a sign and they thought if they saw a sign, then it would prove definitively who Jesus really was. The disciples in the boat had failed to see who Jesus was for them. And here we have the blind man in Bethsaida giving us a beautiful enacted parable, a symbol of our own hearts, that if we're going to get out of the spiritual darkness that we're in, we need Jesus to work in us. Of course, that's what Jesus always does. He opens people's eyes. I love the way Luke talks about it in Luke chapter 24. After the resurrection, Jesus' disciples scatter because they don't know he's risen from the grave yet. And two men were on their way to a town called um, Emmaus. And on the way, a stranger walks up to them, and uh, they start walking together and talking about the events of the day, how their Savior, their rabbi, was crucified, and they were distraught and disappointed because... They thought that he had a plan to save the world, and um, of course that plan seemed to be falling apart right in front of their very eyes. So this stranger walks with him to the house, and he gets there, and they're sitting down for dinner, and he takes the bread, and he breaks it, and he blesses it. And Luke says in Luke 24, 31, when he broke the bread, their eyes were opened, and they realized it was Jesus, and then he vanished from their sight. A little later, Jesus shows back up in Jerusalem behind a locked door where the 11 disciples are gathered together. And he comes in, and they're shocked to see him. And he says, you guys are so foolish and slow to believe. And Luke says that he opened up the scriptures, and beginning with the prophets and the law, he explained to them all the things that were written about him and that had taken place. This is the way Jesus works. He comes and he opens people's eyes so that they can understand who he really is. When we saw the deaf man, we saw that this was a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 35. You remember that? Let's look over there in it. He said, The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the air above will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shouts of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They'll see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. So encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious hearts, Take courage and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. And then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the deaf ears will be unstopped. That's who Jesus is. In his kingdom, people who are dull and insensitive to spiritual truth, people who can't see beyond their own apathy and skepticism, get to experience the miraculous work of God, whereby he, through his truth, by his spirit, opens our eyes to see him for who he really is. This plays out again and again in the pages of Scripture. Think about the Apostle Paul. Once was a man named Saul, right? And he's traveling around, persecuting Christians, throwing them in jail, and one day he has a vision of a blinding light in the sky, and he's immediately blinded. And he hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, 
Of course, Jesus gives Saul instructions to go on into Damascus and to find a man named Ananias who's going to lay his hands on him and pray for him and he'll regain his sight. And when Paul goes, God's also spoken to Ananias and they meet up and Ananias lays his hands on him and prays for him. And when he does, something like scales fall off of Paul's eyes. He gets to experience for real what you and I have experienced in our hearts. We're blind, but then we see. Later, Paul tries to explain his mission in life to a Roman official named Agrippa. He describes this whole conversion story that I've just told you like this. He said, King Agrippa, I didn't prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Sorry. He told Agrippa, he said... But I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I've appeared to you. This is what I want you to hear. To appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who've been sanctified by faith in me. That was Paul's mission, to go into the world preaching the gospel and to open the eyes of the blind, to help them see the truth about God. And I hope that you've experienced that. I hope that you've experienced God's supernatural work in your heart, opening your eyes to the significance of Jesus. This is what it feels like. When God starts to open our eyes spiritually to who Jesus is, the first thing we recognize is our sin. We start to see our personality quirks differently than we did before. We start to see our behaviors from God's eyes. And we see that maybe we're not as good of a person as we thought. Maybe there are some things about us that need to change. We get really crystal clear on the fact of our sinfulness. The Bible calls this conviction. And Jesus says it's the work of the Holy Spirit of God who convicts the world of sin. So God starts to open your eyes to spiritual things. The first thing you see is your sin. The second thing you see is your Savior. You see Jesus. You say, okay, well, if this is who I am, I need some help. Somebody, oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me? And you see Jesus. You see Jesus as God's Son, who He says He is. You see Him as the only perfect man who's ever lived, the once-for-all sacrifice for every sinner who'd ever trust in Him. You see Him as your hope for a future You see him as the sole purpose of your life. Then you start to see your priorities a little bit differently. The things that once motivated you no longer have the same appeal. And suddenly you want more than anything else to follow Jesus with all your life and you'd be willing to do anything he asks to follow through. That's what it feels like to have the scales fall off of your eyes spiritually. Start to wake up, start to come out of a dark tunnel back into the light. And at first, you're like this man. I can see things. It's a little blurry. I can't see it clear. But God's work is gradual in us. That moment by moment, Each step along the way, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer until finally, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we see now as in a mirror dimly, but then we'll see him face to face. So your vision of God isn't as clear today as it's going to be. And I'd say it's not as clear today as it's going to be tomorrow. Have you experienced that? Has God opened your eyes to see your sin, to see your Savior, 
to see the path in front of you and following him, to see your priorities as he sees them so that you'd reorganize your life to pursue him. If you haven't, maybe what is today? Today. Is he shining a light in the darkness of your own heart and giving you clarity about who he is? Don't settle for the zoomed in view. Take a step back, take it all in until Jesus does his supernatural work in your heart. Will you pray with me?